On December 20th, 1860, South Carolina was the first state to secede from the United States of America. Shortly after that, 11 southern states formed an independent country called the Confederate States of America. War was inevitable. At the Color Plantation in Orangeburg, Jacob Color had died three years before the start of the war. Sarah Elizabeth was left with the care of the younger children and the management of the plantation. All during the war, she worked to get the cotton, you know, planted and harvested and everything. And uh, evidently the slaves, they didn't leave the plantation, they stayed right there. And she took care of them. And she being a lady, you know, she still uh, had all of them, you know, and made the crops and everything that her husband would have done. Her three eldest sons, Hayne, James Willis, and Jake, had joined the Confederate Army. They joined the Edisto Rifles, a military company of Orangeburg, which was one of the first companies in the state to volunteer. A short time after the company was organized, the 1st Regiment of South Carolina Volunteer Infantry left for Charleston on April 11, 1861, to join General Haygood. There was a large crowd at the Orangeburg station to see the troops off. Some of the enthusiastic citizens had taken one of the old cannons, which had lain rusting about the streets since they had been used in the Revolutionary War, out to the station to fire a parting salute. The gun was not mounted, but was fired as it lay on the ground, the muzzle being elevated somewhat by having a block of wood placed underneath it. The trains transporting the troops were stopped on reaching the suburbs of Charleston. The regiment was formed and marched to where it encamped for the night. At 4.30 o'clock the next morning, April 12th, the men were suddenly aroused by the first gunfire on Fort Sumter, and what proved to be four years of bloody war had actually commenced. Wesley Culler, Jacob's fourth child from his second marriage, had joined the Washington Light Infantry of Charleston and was captain in the quartermaster department. Several years later, when the old men and boys were called into service, Uncle Warren Culler, a lad of 15, shouldered his gun and marched away. Uncle Warren was a member of Company F, 15th South Carolina Infantry. With these troops, he served until the surrender of General Lee. On one occasion, Uncle Warren was taken prisoner, and the Yankee officers, seeing his extreme youth, told him to go home to his mother. Hugh Clayton Culler. Sarah Elizabeth had five boys, and four of them left. Only little Edwin, my grandfather, was too young to go. He was only six years old. Sarah's fourth child, Julia, also saw her husband, Dr. Samuel Kennerly, don the gray uniform and become a first lieutenant. One battle was of particular interest to the Color family. About four miles below Petersburg, Virginia, at the Yellow Tavern, General Grant had captured the Weldon Railroad. General Haygood's brigade was withdrawn from the front lines and sent there to attempt to recapture. Haygood went into the fight without support, and at this time his brigade had been reduced since reaching Virginia from 2,300 men to 743, which was the number he took into the fight on this memorable Sunday, August 21, 1864. Of these, only 273 came out. With a deafening yell that could be heard above the thunder of cannon, the line rushed forward into the jaws of death. Lieutenant Samuel N. Kennerly, the husband of Aunt Julia, was shot down. Uncle Hayne Culler paused a moment over his sister's dying husband who was still conscious, though mortally wounded. Lieutenant Kennerly unbuckled his sword and fumbled for his gold watch and asked Uncle Hayne to give them to Aunt Julia. Uncle Hayne picked up the sword and watch, and as he straightened up, a bullet whizzed through the breast of his uniform, barely grazing his skin. Undaunted, he rushed along with his charging comrades. Eventually, the small and severely overmatched Confederate brigade was surrounded with no chance for victory. General Haygood waved his hat over his head and called to his men to follow him out, passing over scores of their comrades who had fallen. The Confederates had retreated a considerable distance before they were opened up upon from both flanks and the rear. Many were killed in the retreat. During the retreat, several Confederates were left behind, among them being Uncle Jacob Culler, a lad of 18 years. One of his comrades who escaped related that they were crawling on hands and knees beside the railroad, and as he was going around a hedgerow, he looked back and saw Uncle Jacob smile and wave his hand to go forward. He was never seen again. Another soldier said that they saw Jake wave at him and tell him to go on, so they know he must have been mortally wounded at that time. Meanwhile, James Michael Moss was a young lad who had been educated at the prestigious Poplar Springs Academy. 
In January 1862, at the age of 15, he was admitted to the Citadel, the Military Academy of South Carolina. The following year, his father, James Irwin Moss, wrote to his son, Dear Jimmy, I hear it is thought the city will likely be attacked soon. If so, I expect the Citadel will be called out. And if so, my son, do your duty like a man and trust in a great and good God. May he bless you and preserve you is my constant prayer. My respects to the boys. Yours truly, J.E. Moss. James Michael Moss would soon join the fight. The whole class went into the service in the Confederate service, and they were stationed first right out of Charleston, Morris Island, I believe it was, and they were assigned to the uh, artillery. And at the fort there on Morris Island was built out of palmetto logs. Now, a palmetto log is, is a, a, a mass of fibers, and it's very absorbent. And uh, in one skirmish they had there, a bullet came through that one of those palmetto logs and struck my grandfather in the chest and dropped at his feet. Well, he picked that bullet up and he brought it home with him when he got out of the service. Grandfather never talked too much about his service, but I can remember as a child at his knee listening to him tell some tales and he told me that his meal oftentimes was just a, less than a handful of parched corn. And I said, parched corn, what's that? He said, you go get me a handful of corn and I'll get your mother to show what parched corn looks like. And I got it, a handful of corn, and brought it in. And my grandfather had told my mother what to do, and she parched that corn. You know, it wasn't bad. <laughs> and if you didn't have anything to eat, I imagine it was real good. <laughs> but uh, he was very fortunate. He, he never was wounded, but they had a rough time. 